Good afternoon, a warm welcome to you all, and thank you for joining Worth in our next Normal series. My name is Paul Stamoulis, Executive Officer of Worth Media, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's program, where each week we delve into a different sector to understand its impact of what's happened, but also look ahead into the future for the industry. We are so fortunate to have such an engaged community and grateful to see all of you here today. We hope you are staying healthy and safe during this time. Before we begin, a few program housekeeping items. First, uh, attendees are muted on entry. If that's not the case, we ask that you look down now just to avoid any uh, audio or tech issues and please place yourselves on mute. Second, this is a conversation and we very much welcome your questions. To do so, just use the chat function, send them directly to me uh, and I will turn it over to you directly where Molly will unmute you to ask the question. If you prefer not to ask the question directly, simply add an asterisk to your question and I will try to weave in as many questions as we can. We are very excited to spend the next hour addressing topic seven in our series, which is one of increasing discussion for us all, whether it's because we're cooped up in our houses, it's the start of summer or the hopeful resumption of business, we are all starting to talk about travel and in particular flying and how things will change going forward. Well, we delve into that question today with a private aviation focus, and to help us with that, we have three terrific guests joining us. First, we welcome back Kathy Entwistle. Kathy is a senior executive at Morgan Stanley Private Wealth Management, and Kathy and her team provide financial counsel to several successful clients and families, many of whom fly, uh, fly privately, I'm sure. Kathy, welcome again. I know you are in the business of supporting your clients who themselves and I'm sure their portfolios are going through a lot right now. So I know you're super busy. Thank you for joining us. Uh, first off, how are you doing personally? And then maybe if you could just give some context to your team's work at Morgan Stanley. I think I might be frozen. Can you hear me okay? You're back. I sure can. Paul, I apologize. I think that I might be frozen. We're no busy problem. With our clients. Uh, I don't know if you can, why don't you, why don't you try again? I think you're unfrozen now. Okay, great. Thank you for having me, Paul. I, I love spending time with you and the Worth family and all of the amazing guests that join us every week. Um, excited to hear from both Rob and Mike today. Our clients are really, you know, very very concerned about the uh, economy, the environment, um, and their health. And I think that flying privately is something that we're hearing more and more about. And I'm looking forward to sharing some insights on the call today. Terrific. Thank you, Kathy. Um, well, there are several of Kathy's clients, I'm sure, that are fractional jet owners. Uh, and for that, there is a service called FlexJet, and it's led by Chief Executive Officer Michael Silvestro. Mike is an industry veteran, having originally built flight options uh, into what is now the combined flex jet operation. Mike, thank you for joining us today. I, I know you've been through a, a previous business challenges. Uh, first off, how are you doing personally? How is the flex jet team? Uh, and how is everyone managing during this time? Well, thanks for having me, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you and all those at Worth. Uh, thank you for asking personally. Um, I'm doing fine, healthy, and I'm also pleased to report that we've only had just uh, three, uh, four actually reported cases from uh, across all of our worldwide employees and all of them uh, really did not get uh, sick, severely sick and so they're all doing very, very well. So from a personal and health standpoint, I'm pleased to report that uh, the FlexJet family is in good stead. So it has been a very challenging uh, three months, 100 days worth of, of business uh, it, to say that uh, activity flew, flew, uh, kind of fell off a cliff would be an understatement as it is for, for the whole world. But uh, I'm happy to share some interesting things that I think we've done uh, that I'm very proud of with regard to the business. And uh, so just a pleasure to be here. So thanks. For well, we're excited to hear and thank you again. Um, and then for anyone looking to purchase a new aircraft, uh, especially a Citation, uh, we're really pleased to have Rob Scholl join us here. Rob, um, is a senior vice president and uh, global head of sales with Textron. And for those that may or may not know Textron, uh, it's a manufacturer of a complete fleet of airplanes uh, across its Hawker, Beechcraft, and Cessna model brands. Uh, Rob, glad to have you with us. Thanks for joining. Uh, I know that Textron is a large company. You're a significant employer in your state. 
Uh, I know in your, you and your team have been focused on employee health uh, and safety. Um, so how are you doing and how is the Textron family doing and managing overall? Sure. Th thanks for having me, Paul. Uh, personally, um, I'm doing very well. Blessed, actually. My, my wife and kids here in Wichita, health, healthy, happy. Um, we're doing just fine. Um, for our employees, uh, largely doing well. We have 13,000 uh, employees worldwide. We've actually been dealing with this since December, and myself personally. I have the honor of leading our joint ventures that we have in China, as well as I have some sales folks in China as well. And so we've been really dealing with this since December. Um, we had an early employee affected by COVID-19 in China. So this is something we've been dealing with for a while. We've been taking a lot of steps uh, for all of our employees in Europe, Asia, Latin America. And like Mike, we've been really lucky that we've only had a few employees affected, no one seriously. And here in Wichita, Kansas has largely escaped some of the worst of the COVID-19 impact. So we're pretty lucky, um, just trying to focus on making sure we keep our employees and our customers safe and taking care of the business where appropriate. But th thanks again for having me today. Happy to have you and, and it's uh, fortunate news to hear. Um, well, uh, quickly for those joining, uh, thank you and welcome again uh, to Series 7, The Next Normal. Uh, we're pleased to have Rob Scholl, uh, SVP at uh, Textron Aviation, Mike Silvestro, CEO of FlexJet, and Kathy Entwistle, uh, MD at Morgan Stanley. Um, why don't we dive right into it? Um, Mike, maybe start with you. I mean, big picture, um, you know, air travel requires flyers. There are new questions about whether people are going to travel differently or, frankly, just less going forward. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, when you look at the trends, uh, and it's probably even too early to, to, to get some concrete lens on this, but what trends do you see uh, and how will, uh, frankly, all of aviation, private and commercial, uh, handle it and how will private aviation in particular uh, fit into that equation going forward? So the way that I look at it, I, I think that all of us that are in the business of hospitality and particularly moving people uh, uh, away from their homes, are uh, including the airlines, hotels, resorts, rental car companies, Uber. I, I think all of those people, all of those organizations were in for an intermediate period of people just moving around less. I just think it's inherently uh, going to be challenging. I just think people are going to be adverse to the amount of travel that they did before. So I think there'd be some sectors inside that that are due to be impacted more severely. The, you know, the two that pop to mind to me are the airlines and you know cruise ships where you're packing a lot of people into a dense space. I think for us in private aviation, I think we're gonna buck that trend. I think that we inside this macro downward pressure have great opportunities for upside potential because we are inherently uh, much more of a safe way to fly. And if you look at any of the statistics out there, there are a tremendous amount of the percentage of people that had the financial wherewithal to fly privately in some form or fashion, whether it's buying a whole aircraft from Rob or to fly someone fractionally with FlexJet. I think that um, there were a lot of people that chose not to spend their money this way that going forward will say, you know, we're not flying the airlines anymore. We are going to deploy our, our resources to fly privately. So I'm actually very optimistic for a private aviation inside this macro pressure of people just moving around less. Sure. Great opportunity. And Rob, I, I, you know, you know, bringing that over to, to your business, you know, um, I know new planes in particular, you know, new set of features, uh, you know, Lord knows passengers know more about air quality on the aircraft than they ever have. Um, and that among many other safety and economic features. Um, you know, talk if you can about just aircraft acquisition trends. Are people buying more new planes and will they be buying more new planes nowadays? Yeah, it, it's, been, it's been an interesting few months to watch. Um, for us, we have everything from small piston airplanes in the 172 through utilitarian airplanes like the Cessna Caravan that does uh, cargo and passenger work up through the Citation jets. And we've seen mixed market reactions. So for our private aviation, business aviation customers, we saw 75% you know, drop in flying. But for our cargo customers, our special missions customers around the world, we actually saw an uptick in flying um, over the, the downturn. So 
for our people who were doing service and parts support, they were very busy during that point in time, making sure that we were supporting those customers. So it's been an interesting trend to watch. I think we also have an interesting view of the marketplace because not only are we doing new aircraft sales, but we'll do, we're one of the biggest players in uh, used aircraft transactions as well, which helps us move new airplanes. And we've seen a very active pre-owned market um, in the last three months. And our piston market, which is the small end of the market for us, never really stopped. It was interesting because our salespeople have piston airplanes. You have customers who are sitting at home with nothing else to do, but they have a passion for aviation. And so they were out showing airplanes to customers and we were actually selling piston airplanes during the, the depths of the shutdown, which was interesting to watch. And what we're seeing is uh, almost what I would call a bottom up lead recovery in aviation in that the less expensive the aircraft, uh, the smaller the aircraft right now seems to be leading the recovery for us. Um, so for me, that, that's a pretty encouraging to see. The other trend that we see are when you have an individual decision maker, um, they are more likely right now to make a move over a company or organization that has to go through an approval process. And so what we're seeing right now is the people that are buying airplanes from us are those people who are agile, able to move quickly, and typically have a need to move for business. Right. Um, as Mike kind of highlighted, I think the commercial aviation space will be changed by this. Either you won't be able to find the, the flight that you need, or you don't feel comfortable putting your employees on a commercial um, route for one reason or the other. And so I think business aviation is become, going to become more of a necessary tool. And that's, that's the trends that we're seeing. And I think we're beginning to see, as Mike highlighted too, that people want to travel. And we talk to our customers and they're talking about getting a lot of forward bookings right now, August, September timeframe where people are almost putting a, a flag in the ground saying, I am going to go somewhere later in the summer, almost something to look forward to. So I, I agree with Mike. I think there is a pent up demand and there's things like private aviation that can really buy more time back into people's lives, which is one of the few things you money can't buy in life. Well, you know, just picking up on that, I think, um, you know, I, I know we're talking private aviation, but commercial has a, has a big barometer as to how people will think about the decision to, to make a commitment in private aviation. Just curious to get both your perspectives uh, before I turn it over to Kathy around, you know, what, what does commercial look like? Will it eventually return? I mean, you hear the stories of, you know, what the onboarding experience would be, what the airport situation will be. I mean, there's 5,000 FBOs, there's 500 commercial airports. Um, you know, is, is commercial going to recover in a way that, um, you know, starts to bring us back to the old norm? Or do you think this is a new era for just private aviation simply because commercial never returns? Mike, maybe I'll start it with you. Uh, well, I, let me first off by saying it's public information that uh, I believe Warren Buffett sold all of his airline stocks uh, that came out in Berkshire's annual meeting about six weeks ago. Yeah. So if we like to think that uh, Mr. Buffett is perhaps the most prolific investor of all time, that's data point number one. Uh, I, I really, I, you know, time will tell, but I just think that the airlines are so challenged in, on so many different fronts. Number one, the experience of, of being packed in a, you know, in a tube with hundreds of people that you don't know for hours is unnerving, at least, at least it is today by the knowledge that we currently have of the coronavirus. The other thing to realize is the personal interactions that you have to go through in a commercial airport are in the potentially, certainly if it's not thousands, it might be thousands at O'Hare and JFK and LAX in Atlanta, but certainly hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, as opposed to you know, single digits uh, at, a, at, a, at an FBO, a private FBO. So I just think the airlines are, they have a very tough road to hoe. And I think, um, I think as, demand re, as demand decreases, I think they'll be forced to cut back on routes and secondary markets uh, just to try to uh, uh, create a, a newly profitable model, which in, in, in some regards, accentuates the opportunity for us in private aviation. So secondary markets have always been a strong marketplace for us because of the lack of commercial travel. I just think it just gets accelerated. 
Interesting. Rob, I'm, I'm curious to add some thoughts here. No, I, I agree with Mike. I mean, I don't know. I'm not an Oracle here, right? And uh, I'm not sure what commercial aviation is going to come back. But in the medium term, at least, we see the impact here in Wichita as commercial service has been cut back. And that's, that's a challenge for us to move people around. Um, I, I do think that just the hassle or perceived invasion of privacy that some of our customers talk about with commercial travel and screening that's necessary to do to take place. If, if you can avoid that and save time again is the big thing. And you know, the perceived health benefits of not having all the interactions. I think that that's something that will benefit our industry. Um, and you know, I, I hope for our global macro economy that the commercial aviation market is able to find a way back because that helps everyone succeed. Um, obviously it's too important for the macroeconomic world. Um, so hopefully they, they find their way back, but I do think they have a, a, a challenging way forward. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, Kathy, maybe shifting over to you, you know, I'm curious just as a client matter, a customer matter. I mean, um, I have to think you have customers that, you know, whether, you know, are either entering flying private for the first time, or if they're, um, you know, knee deep into flying private, making a bigger commitment, whether that's through um, a fractional ownership move or through an outright acquisition, um, I mean, the trend to think about and fly private for clients uh, that you may have, um, how do you help clients through that decision? Financially, it, it's not going to make sense. It's going to be a hard argument to make. So how do you, how do you help uh, clients through that conversation? Does Morgan Stanley offer, um, you know, some experience and expertise around some of this as well? I'm curious. Sorry, there was a little delay on getting unmuted. I apologize. Thank you, Molly. Um, yeah, so a couple of things. I want to re reiterate what Mike and Roth said. I agree with them. I think that, you know, COVID-19 is actually an opportunity for private flying versus commercial. Um, I think that a lot of people are starting to look at that. And even companies, if you think about it, one of the reasons why they're, one of the reasons why they're not bringing everybody back into big buildings in metropolitan areas is because they're worried about the health of their employees. They're worried about liability. They're worried about a lot of things and a lot of the unknowns. And by transferring business flying from commercial airlines to private, I think they're transferring risk as well and or reducing risk, I should say. So it's interesting. I'm curious to see if companies will increase their corporate you know, fleets or if they will purchase shares for their business travelers. And I think that will set the tone going forward. Um, if you guys remember, you know, 9-11 uh, was pretty scary. All the, you know, the, the planes that uh, were attacked, people didn't want to get back up in the air particularly on commercial planes. And it took a while, but it started with business travelers. Business travelers were the first to go back up in the air. And I believe that it's gonna be business travelers or people who can pri uh, fly privately that will go back up in the air first. So I do think that business is going to lead the way with what this is gonna look like going forward. And again, time will tell. Right now, I see it's a great opportunity for our private clients to start thinking about how they want to travel. And we do have um, at Morgan Stanley in-house um, ways to help finance uh, the purchase of an aircraft and things like that. Um, so it's through our tailored lending program. So I think that it's always good to have a conversation with your advisor um, about options and opportunities uh, and to see what's available to you. I do, I do think we are starting to have conversations with a lot of clients. Uh, we have clients that are doing shares. Um, I know that we've had uh, at the firm recently some purchases of aircraft as well. So I think it's a trend that is going to continue and just get stronger. So I would say like Rob and Mike's companies are well positioned for where the puck is going. And, um, and, I, and commercial airlines will, will, will have to wait and see. I, I think it was Mike that brought up Warren Buffett and um, he, you know, he definitely has had good insights into where, to, you know, where the opportunities are and to take money out of that, 
the airline industry says a lot about where he thinks that's going. Yeah, I would add that uh, one of our biggest customers is NetJets, and I would say that they're that part of the aviation investment of Warren Buffett seems to be pretty strong. So yes. take take that as a as a data point there. Yes, perfect. And um, maybe if we can turn to safety, I know that's a big driver as to why people from a value standpoint would, would look to a decision to fly private. Um, Mike, I know you, you guys have taken some pretty extensive measures, I think just even in the movement of your crew and, and doing so away from uh, in, a, in a closed architecture across your own aircraft. Maybe just talk if you could about, you know, if someone comes to you uh, with a concern about safety, what is the value proposition that FlexJet offers? Well, I think, you know, we've been flying now, Paul, for 25 years and I, and I, our safety record has been nothing short of outstanding. Um, I can cite you uh, accolade after accolade, but I think a couple of the things that we've done just most recently, number one, we were one of the very first large operators to um, uh, utilize a, in a very professional, uh, a very effective Microshell 360, a disinfectant for all the aircraft. But I think probably one of the most creative things that we've done that no one else has done is, you know, in our model, the, our crews, our, air, our, our, our pilots end up flying the airlines to meet the airplane to where it's at to start their rotation on their tour of duty. It typically lasts, give or take, about a week. So two crew members leave their domiciles, they fly to meet the airplane, they fly the airplane for a week, and then they fly home, and the next crew comes and flies and meets the aircraft. So early on, we recognized that the most significant thing we could do for the well-being of our crews and their families when they got home and our customers was to take our pilots off the airlines. So we essentially, within a matter of less than a week, created an internal airline, a shuttle that we dubbed Project Lift. And we have been flying around our crews on our fleet of aircraft so that they have been completely 100% taken off the airlines. And so I just think that just speaks to the level of commitment and culture at FlexJet to make sure that not only our employees, our crew members are well taken care of, but that translates into our customers. We've committed to continue this program throughout the summer and early fall. So uh, it's just something that I think uh, our, I'm just so proud of the way in which we've been able to come up with creative solutions that, uh, that we did this so quickly and so effectively that uh, it's been very, very impactful. I bet. And, and Rob, just quickly over to you. Um, I'm curious about the safety question as well. Um, uh, I mean, the logistics around, uh, you know, where these aircrafts are, are flying, obviously, you know, you have folks that have dedicated crew, and, but, but everything from maintenance uh, on the aircraft. Um, also, if you want to touch on, I'm, I'm just fascinated by your special mission area and, and know that there's just a lot of other ways that, you know, safety gets dealt with in the air and stuff. So, uh, a question over to you around safety and, and how you think Textron is is positioning. Yeah, it's it's obviously been a, a big factor for us. Um, even again, back in, since December um, with our teams in China, you know, we've taken a lot of steps from the manufacturing standpoint. We did institute quickly some furloughs in the factory just because of the way airplanes are built. It's difficult to do the social distancing. Um, but much like Mike, we've had to change the way we operate our aircraft and we do the same thing now. We move our uh, crews around um, with our own aircraft. We typically, you know, pilots might go out with an airplane for a week and stay in hotels where now they're shuttling back and forth to Wichita. Um, so we've been doing a lot of different steps like that. Um, we've also become experts in exactly which cleaning materials in the airplanes are disinfectants and for what, what do they disinfect and what's safe for wood, what's safe for leather. And you know, it's been a customer question from day one here on how you do that. So we've done that. I can tell you all of my salespeople know to the second how often our airplanes recirculate the air and they either go through the engines to be sanitized or they go through a HEPA filter, which is about two minutes per airplane in case you're interested, uh, that the cabin air gets recycled. So we know that. Um, but for us, from a service perspective, we're pretty lucky. We have the largest uh, service and support network worldwide. So we have company facilities in Asia, Europe, all over North America, um, almost uh, 75 mobile service units. So lucky for us, we don't have to trans. We have very few customers worldwide where we don't have local support available. So we've been able to leverage that without doing a lot of uh, airline travel where necessary. Um, 
So that's, it's been, it's been a learning experience uh, for me, obviously as a leader, I've never been through this, learned the, uh, the value of over communicating with your employees um, at the same time, empowering the local employees to make the decisions. I had a discussion with my leader in Singapore where I told, she asked me what she should do. And I said, you're on the ground, you make the decisions, I'll support you, right? And so it's empowering our employees to make the right decisions to protect their people. Um, so it's, it's been interesting. From a, a special mission standpoint, you know, it, it's, it runs the full gamut for us. We, uh, one of our largest customers in our piston business is Civil Air Patrol. And so they've been out doing necessary missions um, for different agencies, providing material um, where necessary. We support Royal Flying Doctors down in Australia. And they've been critical to um, the response down in Australia. So we've been involved worldwide, whether it's agencies um, or our customers. We've got a lot of stories of customers flying material around. And even here in Wichita, I'm, I'm really proud of our people in the factory. You know, we, we made face masks that we provided to local hospitals. We provided face shields as well, too. So it's been a real integrated effort. Um, our customers, our employees have all come together to, to focus on providing uh, safe operations for people worldwide. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing. Um, well, uh, for those that uh, have joined since we last spoke, welcome again. It's the uh, Worth Next Normal series, uh, series seven. Uh, we're, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Kathy Entwistle, MD of Morgan Stanley, Mike Silvestro, CEO of FlexJet, and, and Rob Scholl, SVP and Global Sales Head at Textron. We're starting to get uh, a flurry of questions in, uh, so I'm very excited about that, and we'll try to turn to as many as we can. Um, we had a question from Caroline Bailey, and Molly, if we can turn it over to Caroline, it's an interesting question about international travel. Uh, Caroline, can you hear us? Yes. Over to you. Yeah, so I was curious about international travel and when that will start, and uh, commercially, and also, what impact or opportunity is for private jet travel internationally? Sure, Mike, maybe we could ask you to take that one. Sure. Uh, well, the international uh, markets have been uh, more challenging than domestic uh, in the last 100 days, just because every single country has had different um, entrance uh, requirements. You know, some as recent as France and the UK that still required 14 day quarantines for anybody entering the country. So, you, you know, it doesn't take a genius to realize that no, you know, no one was going to go to visit those, those countries. So, but those have all, uh, most have been lifted, if not all of them. And we expect almost all of them to be lifted if they haven't been at this point. We've been flying internationally every day since. So early on, we did some repatriation flights. And then ever since we found, um, you know, there's been a constant flow of international travel. So I, I think it's going to be, I don't, I can't speak about the airlines, uh, but for us, it's rather, been rather consistent that we, you know, we've expanded significantly. We have operations in the UK and in Milan, Italy. It sort of jumps us off into Europe and to other parts of the world, but we've been operating um, in, uh, internationally the, the whole time. It's interesting, actually, Mike, that you say that one of my clients was supposed to go to Greece um, for just a casual, like, trip, yeah. and they were told that they would have to be quarantined for 14 days, yes. and if they did test positive for um, COVID, then they would have to be quarantined in a government-sanctioned, sort of overseen um, hotel makeshift hospital. Yeah. How about so that? They, a, so they canceled their trip. Yeah, how about that for a potential vacation, Kathy? So <laughs> that, would, that would defer even the, deter even the uh, uh, most adventurous of us. And that was just like a week or two ago. Mm -hmm. So how does that, I just have a quick question. So for somebody who is, is traveling, uh, as I think, um, as the Caroline Bailey just asked is, so if a, if a client is going to travel to somewhere like Greece and they have these rules, those real rules still apply whether you're flying private or you're flying commercial, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, no escaping there. Um, uh, another question that's come in, um, you know, about the, the um, confidence question and when will travelers, you know, start to have a degree of confidence? And I think that's a hard question to answer, but um, really it gets back to, uh, this question ties into basically type of aircraft. So. 
Rob, over to you. I mean, um, you know, you're a manufacturer of ultra long all the way down, down the pipe and know what others are doing. Uh, Mike, I know you have some orders in for a Gulfstream 700. I mean, you know, will people start to look at the type of aircraft and say, oh, if it's that plane, I'll go make that trip. Or if it's not, you know, if this plane is too old, I'm not getting on it. Um, how, does, how does aircraft start to really matter in, in the question of travel and confidence for, for travelers? I'm curious. Rob, I'll have you start. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'd say it's increased um, in the focus on which type of airplane. And the best example that I can give you is that we're talking to a number of corporate flight departments that in the past may have bought an ultra long range jet um, because they're assuming that they're going to do a lot of travel from China to Asia, or I'm sorry, California to Asia. Um, and what we're seeing now is they're beginning to look at their fleet and saying, do we have the right mix? And so, or they're looking at it and say, we have the ultra long range jet for certain people within the company to fly, but we need to move around key personnel. And so we're having discussions more about adding a King Air 350 to an ultra long range jet or making sure that they have the right mix. Um, I'd say we're also seeing an increase right now in customers talking to fractional companies um, like NetJets, like FlexJet, um, or companies that are doing other charter um, like, or membership models like Wheels Up. I think companies are looking at how to use aviation as a tool um, and they need lots of different tools to fit the mission. So it's pretty interesting to watch that evolve. That's interesting. We have another question that came in. Um, what is the one thing you've been most surprised by in having to shift how you do business? Interesting question to ask. Mike, uh, what do you think? Well, I, uh, I think it's, I think the, my first thing that pops to mind is more of a philosophical response, which is, you know, we've all talked for decades about how we all need to be um, adaptive in business. Uh, I don't think, I don't think as a, a business community, we've been challenged more uh, on that, on that front than in the last 100 days. If I think about the way in which uh, at FlexJet that we have, created, uh, we've had to be creative, we've had to be innovative in very thoughtful, but also very um, um, uh, responsive ways uh, that beyond anything that any of us could have imagined even in our wildest dreams. So I think, I think the quickness the, the, that we've, we've sort of morphed into significant decisions I mean, for us to create an in-house airline within a matter of a week and execute it to the level of effectiveness that we had is just one example of how all of us in every single sector have had to adapt and adapt very quickly. So it's really more of a philosophical response to, for me. Yeah, and probably one of a, a thousand other things that run through your mind when you're trying to answer that question as well. Uh, Rob, over to you. What, what do you think? For us, uh, maybe to take a little different tack, because I think Mike covered that piece very well, and I agree with what he said. For, for us, talking to customers, it's made us approach the market differently. Um, with Cessna and Beechcraft, we have a long aviation history, so we tend to be airplane junkies. We love to talk about airplanes, and the, the discussion has shifted. Um, you know, I, I, I can tell you there was maybe one salesperson on my team who knew how quickly the air circulated within the airplanes. Right, and that's a key topic of discussion. But what I've been challenging my team on is we're seeing, we're having discussions with people before who have never talked about owning an aircraft or people who are calling us and saying, we've been flying commercially, we wanna fly privately, but we have no idea how to do it. And in aviation, we have a history of making aviation complicated because it's aviation. And so we are trying to make it an easier process for customers to come into aircraft ownership. And, um, you know, so we offer more as a transition service management services for our customers. So you know, you have the need for a private aircraft. We're going to help you get into it and pass you off to another management company or help you set up your own flight department. Um, or we're having more discussions about, you know what, sometimes whole aircraft ownership isn't right for everybody. Let's look at other options for you. And so there's a lot of discussions right now where we're playing more informal advisor as opposed to just strictly selling airplanes. And 
frankly, for me, and I think for our team, that's, that's proving to be an enjoyment to express that creativity. And uh, a related question that's come in about uh, aircraft on the secondary market. I mean, low fuel prices uh, have to be a lot of planes that are out there. Um, you know, is now a good time to be looking at, you know, pre-owned aircraft? And is that, you know, is this the, the, sign the buy signal time for that kind of decision? Careful, I'm an aircraft salesman. It's always a good time to be looking at <laughs> um, It's the, the used market is pretty interesting right now. Um, coming into the COVID situation, um, pre-owned aircraft available for sale were at a historic low. Um, aircraft that are 10 years or younger, um, in some cases, depending model by model, for our fleet, less than 2% of the fleet is available for sale. Compare that back to 2008 and nine, where 15% of the fleet was for sale. So good new aircraft or new, recent new uh, airplanes are difficult to come by. And the industry overall has done a good job in the last 10 years of not overbuilding. I would caution that the pre-owned market is a interesting place. And I will say it that way. And there, I, I would caution people who are looking into the pre-owned market to make sure you get a trusted advisor to go into that market with you. Um, because each individual airplane is different. Each individual uh, aircraft segment and model has its own dynamics. And so it's not a bad time to go into the used market, but it's not a bargain hunter's dream by any stretch of the imagination right now. I think the market will evolve differently, um, uh, but depending on which segment you go into, but um, it's a time to buy, but there aren't, there still are not a lot of airplanes out there for sale right now. Interesting. Um, Mike, maybe a question for you. Um, you know, what are the you know types of uh, what, what disruption has occurred in private a aviation, and what types of companies will have the biggest growth opportunity, and are there new business models? I think this probably gets into when you look at aircraft management companies versus you know companies that are owning their fleet and and, and leasing. I mean, you've had to be nimble, and uh, you have a wonderful fleet, and 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 can provide a, a fractional ownership experience. Is there a new type of program or service offering that will uh, start to unlock here as we get into this new era of, you know, first time flyers or less frequent flyers, that kind of thing. Well, I guess time will tell, Paul. I mean, uh, the, um, you know, one of the early models or the, you know, models that everybody has been talking about is this democratization of private aircraft uh, or private air travel or the by seat model. You know those have really not um, those have really not caught on. And if you think about it, by the seat model is sort of counterintuitive to what we're doing at private aviation, which is you know you know everybody that's on going to be on your airplane and you want it to be safe and and, and secure. So for us, you know I, I think I think the ultimate in sort of control in private aviation, of course, is to buy your own airplane and to crew it yourself and to maintain that. I think that certainly is great opportunity for the manufacturers, the OEMs. I think uh, that's a big stretch, though, from someone that's not flown privately before to jump all the way to owning your own airplane. Right. So I think uh, at FlexJet, I think as I look at our model, we're the closest thing to a level of consistency and reliability with regard to aircraft and the service uh, in a closed environment like an, a macro operator like we are to the whole aircraft experience. So I think for us, I think the model just, uh, you know, just shy of owning your own airplane provides a level of comfort, um, uh, safety, reliability, and consistency that um, I think is poised for some great, great growth potential. So I'm, I'm kind of excited about where we sit. That's great. And uh, maybe a related question, uh, I'll pose it to you, Rob. It's, it's you know, what, what are the bright spots on the horizon uh, away from, from, you know, being an OEM overall, you know, what kind of businesses do you think will start to return uh, faster than others in and around, you know, travel and aviation? Yeah, well, I think, I think the, uh, a lot of the travel, uh, private aviation travel, I think is going to be lead the way. Um, those people who are able to be more flexible in their business model, I think will will succeed. Um, I think those companies that offer low entry point into private aviation will succeed. 
Um, I, I think Mike's right on. The democratization of private aviation, I think, has a lot of potential, but I think there's also um, some pitfalls there. And having seen it from the inside, you know, if anybody here has clients or they're considering themselves getting into private aviation, I would say um, make sure you talk to a trusted advisor or a friend who can coach you because as many good models as there are um, out there for private aviation, there's also been some high profile um, failures that have snared their customers as well too. Um, you know, there's been some in the media, I won't go into names of those that have been out there recently, but just it's, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities. There are gonna be a lot of people trying to seize those opportunities. I would say evaluate who you're partnering with and make sure you know that your investment is safe, whether that's a, a whole aircraft or a fractional share or a membership fee, because it, it's, it's significant for the people who make those investments. Sure is. Hey, I have a question, Paul. Go ahead. Sorry. Sure. Quick question for, for Mike and Rob, uh, for somebody like me who has, you know, ultra high net worth clients who might be interested in the aviation market. Um, I think Rob, you've, you mentioned a few times, you know, a trusted advisor. I don't think you mean necessarily the financial advisor because we are coming in with the financial aspect, but I think maybe you're talking about somebody who really knows aviation and the different planes. I would love for each of you to spend a minute or two just walking us through how somebody who is interested, uh, seriously interested in learning about their options, what are the right steps and how do I as a financial advisor help them through that process? Mike, why don't we uh, start with you? Sure. Well, I think, um, Kathy, what I would recommend, certainly uh, there are some very, very good uh, uh, I'll call them brokers or advisors who high net worth individuals and, and companies engage to help them in their acquisition process and disposition process uh, uh, for whole aircraft companies. I mean, you know, there's Guardian Jet, there's Drew Callen, there's the guys, the Mente Group. I mean, you know, it goes on and on. They're really quality people who've been in the business a long time whose business is to either help people acquire or dispose of whole aircraft. And, you know, they've been in the business for decades and decades and their counsel is very valuable. I think at FlexJet, when you're engaged with us, we, you know, our culture is just genuinely to provide all of the options and, you know, some of the best advice that we've given someone like your clients, Kathy, is to tell them to go buy something from somebody else because that solution is more appropriate than maybe what we have to offer. So there are, there is not a one model fits all. And I think for, for all of us, you know, I'd like to think flex Judd is at the top of the list for all of us that have been in business for 25 years and will be for another 25 plus, you really do the right thing by just uh, telling prospective people what the truly, what the genuinely, what the right solution is for them. And you hope that your solution fits for them but in the long run, if you tell someone, hey, I think you should go buy from, you know, Plan X as opposed to us, I, I guarantee you as a salesperson, they, that person wants to refer you to their clients and their friends because you've told them the truth with no selfish motivation. So it sounds corny, but it's, it's no more complicated than that. No, it makes sense. Thanks. I agree with what Mike said. I mean, for us, when we get customers, um, we try to be an honest broker. Obviously, we're selling airplanes that's in the business. But for us, um, you know, we're, we're involved in almost every aspect of private aviation, whether it's a fractional business. NetJet's our largest customer there. Wheels up, a large customer as well. So one of the worst things my sales team can do is sell an airplane to somebody who's not ready for an airplane because they're probably going to end up selling it again in the not-too-distant future. Um, so we're, you know, we, we like to refer customers to fractional, to charter, to membership models, and that makes sense. But Mike's absolutely right. There's some really good advisors out there, Guardian Jet, Drew Callen that, that Mike mentioned. I think there's also some good tax advisors out there. You can look at uh, legal firms that are, that's what they specialize in. Also some good tax advisory firms out there who is somebody important to consult with that process. Uh, you don't want to necessarily depend on your normal tax advisor because aviation has a lot of unique aspects there and they can also be a good source of information, which maybe sometimes you would view as more non-biased. Um, I would always encourage you to ask the person if they have any ties with a specific 
uh, company as well, too, because there's some of that that goes around. Um, you know, there's no regulatory aspect that allows someone to be an aviation advisor or a broker. Um, you know, anybody can go out tomorrow and call themselves an aviation broker or advisor. So you just have to make sure my kid on it, somebody who's been around gives you a lot of referrals. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Really helpful info. Um, we have another question, which I think is an interesting one. What is meant by semi-private and will there be new, uh, I think they're, I think they're saying new airlines, new opportunities for quote semi-private. Um, Rob, Mike, I'll, I'll, who wants to take this one? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I guess I would describe semi-private as some of the, uh, if you talk about democratization of the airlines or of the private aviation, you do see some companies out there that have even done, uh, you know, per seat models or where you pay a monthly membership and you fly as much as you want with other people. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there trying it. I don't know that we've really seen a successful model there. Um, in my mind, that's the idea of semi-private. I would tell you to just proceed with caution just because, again, there's not a strong track record there and uh, you wanna make sure that you're doing it safely. So just proceed with caution when, when you hear those words. I, I might be more politically incorrect. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, <laughs> secondly, I, I'd be you know, mildly inappropriate and say pick. Either you wanna fly the airlines commercially or you truly wanna have a private experience, but uh, I'm not sure I think I, I think you're getting middle. I'm not even sure what that means. So yeah, exactly. I, I, pro, I apologize for <laughs> I offended anybody, but but that's my thought. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, well, um, uh, we, you know, it, it's been a great conversation. I'd like to now turn it to uh, a conversation that um, I know Juliet asks uh, at our CEO of Worth, which is, you know, when you look at uh, what you've all been through, uh, you know, obviously facing a lot from a business leadership uh, standpoint. Um, I think about bucking the trend um, and the statement you made, Mike, I think, I think that is true. Uh, it sounds like you're both pretty um, positive on where the industry is going. Uh, the question that she often asks is, what gives you hope during this time? And uh, if you step back and take a think about that, um, Rob, maybe we'll start with you. What's, what's giving you hope during this time? Um, I, I think if I look at it, it's the way that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, negative news out there and a lot of divisiveness in the world, but you still see people coming together um, to help other people. And it's, it's, been, it's been a harrowing year for us here in Wichita. Um, you know, we, we had a major explosion in one of our plants back in December, and we thought that was gonna be the biggest impact on our year in 2020. And the Wichita community for us pulled together uh, Spirit Aero Systems across the way, and they really helped us get recover from that. And it's the way that our employees come together and have taken necessary steps to help the business and help our customers in difficult times for them personally and for their families. Um, and then you look at what our customers are doing worldwide, you know, um, doing uh, angel flight missions. I mean, what was touching for me as our owner operator group was very active on their forums during the lockdown, trying to find ways to get patients to hospitals for care urgent care. And for that, that, that's what really gives me hope. And when I look around the world um, for aviation, people still want to fly, right? Our best selling airplane right now is still the 172, which is the one people learn how to fly in. So, you know, we joke about it here. We're passionate about aviation, but that, that's what gives me hope is that people still want to go out there and get in the sky and go on adventures. And that's, that's what's made us successful for 90 years. And I think it will continue for the next 90. Uh, there's a famous quote, to travel is to live, and I think that's very, very, very true. Um, Mike, how about you? What, what gives you hope? Well, uh, you know, really, I echo what, what Rob had said. I think one of the, the coolest things in the last uh, three months was John Krasinski. He did that uh, <laughs> fun show called uh, Some Good News, and, you know, I'm a big fan of John's. I think he's, a, he's just a, a great actor, and so I think we all got wrapped around the axle. Oh, my gosh, there was just so much negative news that – it was just it was just overwhelming, and uh, so I think I, when I look at the at a macro level, and you do look around the world, and the amount of um, the human spirit and how resilient it is, and how really genuinely there are just mostly 
genuinely really good people out there that want to do good by others. And then in the micro world at FlexJet, I just could not be more proud of uh, our, 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 our family members that have just been incredibly helpful to one another and have been creative and innovative, working around the clock to make sure that uh, uh, their colleagues, their fellow employees, and our customers have been well taken care of in a safe and comfortable environment. So I, I'm just hopeful, just based upon what I've seen, the good that comes out of, uh, that has come out of the, the people in the last three months. Yeah, amen to that. And and Kathy, we've asked this question to you a, a few times, but you know, as we've gone through this period and, and hopefully things are starting to open again, uh, I'm curious to ask you the question again. What brings you hope? Sure. Um, I, I will also echo Rob and Mike's uh, comments. And uh, yeah, John Krasinski, I loved watching his uh, show there. Some good news. Um, and I was also going to say the human spirit. And you know, with the human spirit what's been going on these last few months and, and also this last week and a half. Um, it's about finding our way through and around. Um, what gives me hope is that I don't see people leaving other people behind right now. I see people bringing people with them. And I think that is really important and um, to be able to make that impact on others and, and get through this together is huge um, from a, you know, sort of, personal standpoint with business or our firm, Morgan Stanley, our clients. I'm gonna go back to um, the article I read that Jim McCann wrote just this week, um, which he's a friend for all of us, of course, and to all of us. Uh, it was about relationships and the power of relationships. And I'm a big believer in that. I think that it's not necessarily business, it's relationships. And if you lead with that, and find out what's most important to the person that you're speaking with and what their priorities are when it comes to what their values and goals are. I think that's where we connect and that's how we move forward. I think that's beautiful. And um, you know, I, I, my wife and I had a, a daughter who attends school in Scotland and, and then there was a moment there where we didn't know if we can get her home. And uh, you know, I know my wife would have moved heaven and earth to, to get one of your jets, either Mike's yours or yours, Rob, to, to get her across. And so I think putting people uh, with family members and, and doing so through travel and sometimes private travel is a, a very necessary and important thing as well. Um, uh, I want to take a pause here real quick just to uh, tell everybody first, thank you again for joining us. Uh, see, uh, session eight is next week and we're going to turn our attention to impact investing. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, Kathy back again joining uh, Liesl Pritzker Simmons. Juliet Scott Crockford, our CEO, and uh, Etoy Reginald, who is head of global strategy and partnerships for the Will and Jada Smith Foundations. An exciting program uh, next week that we ho hope you can also join us for. But uh, first and foremost, uh, to our speakers, Rob, Mike, Kathy, thank you very much for helping us understand this a bit better. Uh, we hope to, um, I think this is a conversation we can have in a, a couple of months and to see what has still changed and uh, what is still yet to come. I think this could represent a new era of sorts for the, for the industry, and there's going to be plenty, uh, much more to talk about. Uh, but thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing it with our audience. Uh, to our audience, thank you again for attending, and we hope to see you next week. Uh, and with that, I will say goodbye, and uh, thank you again. Thank Thanks, you. Paul. It's awesome. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye, thank guys. You. Bye. Well done, Paul. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully, um, well, well, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of other reasons to, to do so, but you got to get, uh, get that citation in the air and bring it to Westchester for me, if, if you don't mind. I'd, I'd love to. I, I used to live up in Westchester area, so I'd love to get back up there sometime. So. Where'd you live? Newtown. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's really pretty yeah. up there. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, it's uh, raining something awful here, so we're... Uh, I'm looking for some good weather. But again, thank you. And I know it was last minute and, and you guys are great. So uh, I hope to see you in person and, uh, and we'll see you soon. All right, thanks.